and good afternoon. Uh, this talk is about DataNet, a new real-time network verification technique. Before I go into the details about DataNet, I would like to briefly give a sense for what kind of network verification we have in mind and where we fit into the larger picture when it comes to related work. First of all, broadly speaking, the goal of network verification is to detect network outages before they occur, or at least before these errors manifest themselves. To do so, the analysis focuses either on the control plane or the data plane. Techniques for the former include tools such as Buzz, Batfish, and NOD, that's the top half of the, of these slides, whereas notable data plane checkers are Veriflow, NetPlumber, and AP Verifier. Irrespective of the details behind these techniques, the key thing to note here is that as we go up towards the control plane, the verification tasks become significantly harder. In fact, more generally, verification with respect to the data plane is decidable. In fact, under certain conditions, even highly tractable, whereas on the control plane, it is often undecidable or intrinsically intractable, at least on the kind of code we are interested in. So in this work, we are focusing on data plane verification. And what this exactly means, um, at least in our context, I'll illustrate next. In our case, the big picture of real-time ne network verification on the data plane looks something as follows. As depicted on the left here, there are network, uh, the network administrator has given a set of properties that should hold in the network. For example, a standard property to check is the absence of forwarding loops or plaque holds. More generally, the properties we are interested in are so-called reachability properties, which is something which says something about how parts in the network are logically connected. And this includes isolation properties which concern parts of the network that should be logically disconnected. In addition to the properties we want to verify, whatever that may be, there is the data plane, which in our case can be thought of as a graph in which each node consists of a forwarding table that may consist of a single or multiple priority ordered IP prefix based forwarding rules. You may think of the collection of these forwarding tables as a FIP. Given the collection of forwarding uh, tables, a data plane checker checks whether the given properties hold. If not, it produces a counterexample, which can help to track down the root cause of a problem in a network, as illustrated by the red cycle here at the bottom of the figure, um, which corresponds to some forwarding loop. Now, in all of this, it's important to note that this data plane checking is not the same as network monitoring. In particular, a data plane checker could find, say, a forwarding loop, as illustrated at the bottom of the slide, before any packet gets actually stuck in this loop. So network verification is a form of predicting certain kind of, kinds of errors before they occur. And since we want to do so in real time, the goal is to be able to make these kind of predictions in the order of milliseconds and, importantly, without causing false alarms. To do so, current techniques ex exploit at least two characteristics of the problems, which we look at in turn. First, as depicted on the left, most data of the art data plane checkers partition the set of packets according to their forwarding behavior. More concretely, packets belong to the same equivalence class whenever they experience the same forwarding behavior in the network. This is significant because it provides a way of reasoning about many packets at the same time rather than individual packets one at a time, thereby making the analysis much more efficient. Second, as depicted on the right, real-time network verification can be made incremental so that only changes between two data plane snapshots are analyzed as, as opposed to the entire network each time. A notable work that performs such incremental network verification is Verifo, published at NSDI 2013 by Kirschet et al. What is new in DataNet, the topic of this talk, is that we exploit a third characteristic of the problem, namely similarity of forwarding behavior of packets through parts of the network. To illustrate why this is significant, we have to better understand incremental, incremental network verification as used by Veriflow. So let's have a closer look at it. As I mentioned briefly, in incremental network verification, the data plane checker analyzes differences between data planes, which we denote here by the Greek letter data. The problem is that there can be significant overlap between these deltas. And that's problematic when there are disruptive events, say when there are uh, parts of the network that fail, because network failures can result in many changes to the data plane as the system tries to compensate for these failures. But if you, even if you haven't got any 
failures to worry about. It's not uncommon of wanting to verify many data planes in a given time window. That's particularly true if you are uh, a network administrator and you want to try out the different configurations before you push one of these configurations to production. To provide the efficiency that is needed to support these kind of use cases, our contribution is to show how to exploit the overlap between data in order to avoid inefficiencies in incremental network verification. In a sense, what this gives us is a second order way of reasoning about incrementality, where this time it's not just about data, it's about data of data. In a nutshell, for this, we exploit similarity among forwarding behavior of packets through parts of the network. And we sh show through extensive experiments that data that makes it possible to check properties where the state of the art simply times out or takes much longer. But before we go there, I would like to illustrate the problem and our solution in more detail through a simple example. For this, let's consider, consider a simple network that consists of four switches. And let's assume there are four rules depicted here as arrows. Since we're considering IP prefix-based forwarding rules or tables, uh, for, excuse me, forwarding um, ex um, data planes, each of these rules has an IP prefix associated with it, which we de depict by horizontal bars, each of which corresponds to a range of IP addresses. The interpretation is that bars overlap in common sub, uh, sub range of IP addresses. Furthermore, we stack these routes on top of each other based on their priority. Closer to the bottom, we find a lower priority routes compared to the top, which here is the, the red rule that has the highest priority. To date, what happens in tools such as Veriflow is that they will partition the set of IP prefixes based on the endpoints of the corresponding intervals. Concretely, we get the following. These are the equivalence classes of packets deline delineated here by vertical dashed lines. For each equivalence class, Veriflow and similar tools create a forwarding graph that says how packets in that subrange of IP addresses behave. In this example, we get three such forwarding graphs, one for each equivalence class, and it would now be possible to say check for forwarding loops or plaque holes by standard graph algorithms on these kind of graphs. But notice something. I've highlighted it here through these dashed blobs. They show the forwarding behavior of the data plane without the red rule. And this highlighted error illustrates, therefore, that there can be significant overlap between previously and currently constructed forwarding graphs. This leads to inefficiencies that can be prohibitively expensive when real-time con real constra constraints matter. One of our main contributions is to to uh, compress these forwarding graphs. And rather than recomputing forwarding graphs, we incrementally maintain a single edge labeled graph that represents the behavior of or the flows of all packets in the entire network. What we get is a single graph data structure that can be used by the user to answer reachability queries, which we expose to the user through a simple C++ API. A fundamental concept in this API is the idea of atoms, which I've denoted here by the Greek letter alpha. These are the labels that appear in this single edge labeled graph. And to get a better, give you a better idea um, what these atoms are and why they are important, uh, I want to say something about decomposing a complex, some complex stuff, so to speak, into its simpler constituent parts. And although it's a bit of a stretch, just to give you a better idea what I mean, if you have a number and you factor it into its prime numbers, that's the kind of decomposition I'm, I'm talking about. More concretely, in the context of uh, this work, the factorization is with respect to atoms, and it allows us to express any Boolean combination of the forwarding rules that appear in the network through these atoms. So it's a way of factorizing forwarding tables, if you will. An atom itself is nothing else but a half-closed interval denoted here by these um, vertical dashed uh, lines or delineated by these vertical dashed lines. It's important to note, though, that there's a certain uh, compactness property of atoms. In previous work, atoms um, would have been maybe represented by Patricia trees, but that's not, uh, that's not quite the same as what, what we do in our implementation, an algorithm which uses a binary search tree that is balanced. To illustrate what I mean here, consider a simple atom that is the half close interval from 0 to 10. If you were to use a Patricia tree to represent this, you would at least 
you would need at least two Patricia tree nodes, one, say, from, for the interval 0 to 8, and another one for 8 to 10, because those are half those intervals that can be represented through IP prefixes, and the union of these two, two gives you the atom we wanted. Um, we avoid this indirection and represent atoms directly through its endpoints in this balanced binary search tree. To put this all together, uh, this is what we get. So again, let's consider this simple network of four switches. This time we have got only, or we start with only three rules, R1, R2, and R3. R1 is the lowest priority rule, R3 has the highest priority rule, and we get three atoms, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. This could be represented or is represented in this uh, single edge labeled graph. And notice how the atoms, alpha 1 and alpha 2 and alpha 3, appear on these edges according to what the interval are for these uh, three rules that we have got so far. As we introduce a new rule, we may have to introduce new atoms. So in this case, the new atom is alpha 4, which what this means is that we have to, what we call, we have to split an existing atom, in this case it is alpha 1, into two atoms, namely alpha 1 and alpha 2. At this point, I've denoted uh, the splitting only by introducing this atom at the, uh, on the left, left graph um, through alpha 4, which is added now as an atom. But because R4, the new rule we are installing, is, um, has higher priority than the existing rule R1 that, was also in, that is also installed on switch S1, we need to move the atoms that correspond to the interval of R4 to that edge which, cause, which we use um, for that rule from S1 to S4. And DataNet uh, of, uh, takes care of this by through a graph transformation that changes these atoms in the, uh, in the labels, for the, of the labels of these edges. This gives an overall um, high-level flowchart that looks something like this, where you can think of DataNet as a procedure that is called iteratively each time a rule is inserted or removed. And um, at such a, when such a modification happens, what DataNet will do is it will first ask, are new atoms required? If so, it does recreate, recreate the new ones you need, including any atom splitting that may have to be done. Either way, then, it transforms the uh, edge-labeled graph so that we can check the properties. And this repeatedly happens for each modification to the forwarding table. So it needs to be, for any modification to a forwarding table, so it needs to be highly efficient. But before, before I go into the experimental evaluation, I want to say something about um, another side effect of having atoms. One of the important things is it makes it really easy now, or almost trivial, to check all, pair, all pairs reachability um, properties. And that's essential for answering data log style what if queries that have been previously explored at NSDI through works such as uh, NOD and Batfish. The idea here is to adapt the uh, well-known Floyd Warshall algorithm to compute the transitive closure of the graph that we are incrementally maintaining. In this simple example, what happens is that we introduce these extra edges into our graph to represent the fact that certain atoms cannot just travel directly between these switches, but also through, through multiple hops. And that opens up new use cases, which I will go into in a little bit. Um, for our experiments, there are two classes of data sets that, that we use. One are derived from what has been done in the literature previously, particularly work done by Zhang et al. at NSDI 2014, which involves uh, synthetic data sets using the rocket view and Berkeley topologies, as well as IP prefixes gathered um, by the root views project. In addition to these th synthetic data sets, we come up with a new data set that uh, exploit or uses UNOS, uh, a well-known SDN platform, together with a flagship application that that it features, namely SDNIP. SDNIP provides basic interoperability features to ONOS in the sense that it allows ONOS to communicate with external autonomous systems or networks. The experimental setup for SDNIP looks something as follows. So in the middle here, we have got the ONOS controlled SDN network. And in the middle, we have DataNet. DataNet, in turn, subscribes to flow modification events, such as rule insertions and removals, um, by just using the ONUS API. And uh, inside of the ONUS control network, there is a BGP speaker, which in turn talks to 
uh, various external BGP routers. To make this experiment interesting, what we do is we run all of this in Mininet and fail one link at a time different, different links in the network through this event injector on the right here. And as, as, uh, as we inject these arbitrary forwards, Onos tries to compensate for these link failures by rerouting packets around these problem areas. And because we have subscribed to Onos' uh, event notification framework, we will be notified of rule insertions and removals that Onos initiates in order to effectuate the cha these changes to the data plane. And on each rule insertion and removal, we check for the absence of forwarding loops. Overall, our data sets feature several hundred million IP prefix rule insertions and removals, which can be again divided into these two broad classes, into th synthetic data sets as well as SDN IP. Um, the number of links range um, from a few tens to over 40,000, where I should, would like to say that the links correspond to um, the links in the single edge labeled graph, not in the actual topology. There's a slight nuance to that that is explained in the paper. What we do in this first experiment is to check for forwarding loops or the absence of forwarding loops on each rule insertion. And what we see is that in the va vast majority of rule updates, we can analyze these in less than one millisecond. That itself um, mainly establishes that we are at least not no worse, uh, but if you look closely, we are better than the state of the art. But what is really new in DataNet is the ability to go beyond single rule updates. For this, we go back to a query, uh, to a problem that was previously identified by Kirschet et al. In, at NSDI 2013, where they ask, what parts of the network are affected by a link failure? This seems like a very innocent, uh, you know, trivial, or not trivial, but certainly innocent looking query to ask, but it turns out to be extremely difficult for the state of the art, mainly because the number of forwarding graphs that need to be constructed are 100 fold more than in the per rule update scenario. So we want to measure what we gain by incrementally maintaining this single edge labeled graph to represent all packet flows. And what we find is that DataNet can answer these type of queries when Veriflow RI, which is a re-implementation of Veriflow, times out. So that is a significant improvement to what we were previously able to do with these retime checkers. To conclude, DataNet considers the idea of overlap among datas to significantly speed up the answering of data log style queries within a real-time network verification framework. Those queries in such a context were previously out of reach because it required the recomputation of a lot of information. All our data sets are publicly available, and we are very interested to work with industry and academic partners, including interns, to further develop algorithms that can help the community and operators deal with the complexity of networks from that from the perspective of formal methods. So with that, I'm open up for questions. Thank you. Uh, Lenny Drizic, Memorial Research. Uh, so I'm wondering about uh, your choice of data structure, the uh, IP ranges uh, for atoms. So there is this other paper which you cite about using atomic predicates in network verification. They allow very general predicates, you know, basically anything you can express as a Boolean formula. That's, so yeah. what, and, and the advantage of that approach is predicates can be very coarse. Yes, that's so a very good question. Um, one of the important, uh, so every community, community values different things about a uh, 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 piece of work. So you're very rightly pointing out that atoms and the way we have introduced it here very much resembles um, predicate abstraction to some degree. M more precisely, what we are having here is an abstract domain that allows us to uh, concretely uh, and precisely represent relational information. And unlike traditional abstract domains, we incrementally refine the pre precision of the abstraction such, such that we never encounter false alarms. And to my knowledge, that's the first time that through extensive experiments that has been exhibited that this automated, automated refinement of abstraction is not just feasible, but can be made a highly efficient to the degree where you can verify these kind of networks. Okay, so at least the way I described it now, it's exactly what that other work also claims to do. Uh, but maybe they can take it. The, well, one of the differences, the predicate abstraction is all about, comes back to what decision procedures underlying 
um, what that you use for the predicate abstraction. For example, a lot of times set solvers are used in order to introduce new um, free variables into the SMT encoding, let's say. To okay, that, that, that's not hard. It's a different kind of predicate. So, so oh, I see. Maybe so maybe a mis- predicate of Okay, so there may be a, mi- a different uh, predicate abstraction. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Jackie from Yale University. So I have two questions. The first question is, um, what is your memory occupation among those experiments? So the first, uh, the good question. I listed actually as future work, which I have uh, not mentioned yet. Um, the memory consumption of DataNet is significantly higher than our re-implementation of Veriflow. Um, we have some ideas on how to, to mitigate some of this. But, so it's one of the, the one of the questions that is very w- worth by asking. Can we somehow avoid the space-time trade-off that seems to be um, an important component here in this work? But in answering this question, or at least addressing it, one important character or one important thing to keep in mind is at what cost does such an improvement or potential improvement come when it comes to query expressiveness? Okay, so then uh, the second question is, um, I, I, I noticed that all of your experiments are only based on IP field, right? Yes. So, um, I know, as we know, in the reality, mo- uh, uh, the rules are based on multiple, multiple fields, and such as you have port fields, you have other fields. So what is the performance or what is uh, what, what will the memory occupation or your speed going to be when mm-hmm. you have uh, expand to such as um, tens of fields? Yes, uh, excellent question. So one could very well envision having uh, not just a single IP prefix based um, match condition, but m- multiple. Um, or perhaps even uh, not just IP prefixes, but ranging over port numbers. So this is a very excellent question. In general, the problem uh, becomes significantly harder. There, in, the, in the paper, we discussed this a little bit more um, by giving a reference to very recent work, I believe it is still unpublished, that discusses um, what they call overlapping degree of uh, different ranges that can be used in in, uh, in match conditions in these data planes that consist of multiple IP prefix based uh, match conditions. And I believe we could leverage that in order to avoid some of the complexity blow ups that we would encounter in the most general case. When it comes to the idea of atoms, that idea can be generalized to higher dimensions. Currently, we are only considering or have implemented, at least have only shown, the case of a one dimensional. Uh, a single IP prefix. But you can think of, for example, I mean, just to keep it within our human understanding, uh, two dimensions, which would consist of, uh, if you think of it as a geometry, um, as, a, as a box, and the overlapping of boxes where an atom is now not a, a range, but actually a box in itself. So you, you, would, you would decompose these rules into multiple boxes. So I believe there is some, uh, some future in generalizing this, when it comes to running experiments, the, those experiments, I believe, should give the final answer to how viable such generalizations are. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Yifei from CMU. So can you comment a little bit more on the differences between this work and AP Verifier? Because I, re- I noticed they also use labels. Yes. Again, excellent question. So, um, this is a algorithmic, uh, the, di- the difference is in, in the algorithm and the complexity of the algorithm. So in general, just to recap for everyone, for everyone's benefit, AP Verifier is a truly a, a amazing work in the sense that it opens up a very different perspective on how to do real-time data plane checking. And one of the important aspects in it is the idea of atomic predicates. Atomic predicates t- share some similarity with atoms, but are more specialized. They allow a wider ex- range of expressiveness. And as a result, the complexity ends up being higher. In particular, to compute atomic predi- predicates, a quadratic time algorithm has it, it needs to be used. At least that is what they proposed. In this work, the algorithm has a quasi-linear time complexity. And at least from an algorithmic, I mean, asymptotic complexity point of view, should be therefore more efficient. This is actually a very hard research area. So recently, uh, Nikolai Piona has come up with a, a new data structure called DDNF, which, um, at least uh, according to the technical report that was published, is significantly, or promises, potentially be significantly better than atomic pre- um, AP verifier. So what we are planning to do in the future is to do have an experimental comparison that takes DDNF and compares it with DataNet to see um, what type of trade-offs there are in expressiveness and the verification time, the verification time that you get in the end. Okay, thanks. Great. That, um, let's thank the speaker again.